Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in. And you're very welcome along to this edition of Monday Night Rugby. It has been a mixed weekend uh, for Irish provinces, naturally given the fact that they played one another in the final round of seasonal interpros. But uh, some are heading into European action next weekend with their tails up, up some between, with their tails between their legs, most namely uh, Munster, uh, chided with that 38-17 defeat to Ulster at Kingsman Stadium on Friday. Leinster continued to ride the crest of a wave of 54 points to 7 victory over Connacht at the RDS. And they will head to the game with Leon this weekend uh, very much uh, with their dander up. But uh, we have to look at that Munster game, first of all, away to Ulster. And we're joined in studio by the Irish Independent rugby correspondent, Rory O'Connor. And we're also joined on the line uh, by Keith Wood. Good evening to both you gents. Um, Keith, we'll start with that game at Kingspan Stadium on Friday night. Um, after the game, Air Sports had um, Donnick O'Callaghan and Jerry Flannery in studio and they talked about the level of heart and hunger that was required to win that game that was absent from a Munster point of view. It struck me that there was a lot more missing than hunger and heart on Friday night. Yeah, a bit. Um, yeah, I think that's a fair comment. Um, hunger and heart is a particularly um, destructive words to hear from Munster players. They would hate to, to say that um, the players would hate to have it. Um, Munster were a mile off the pace um, on, on Friday. They really were. I mean, it was a very poor performance from them. Um, standard nowhere near the level that they would want to have. And I mean, there's a high level of frustration, I think, when you watch it. And, and look, there's enough of blame to go around on this one by the way. Um, um, but I will say when I look at, when I look at Munster, I, I still see if some changes over the last couple of years, but when we, um, I say we, but when, when Munster get down to second and third choice players getting in, they don't seem to punch at the right level at all. I mean, the strength and depth isn't there in Munster. That is the reality. Um, the only thing that will cover that is a bit of extra heart and passion and elements of that. It kind of fills it in um, and sometimes covers over the cracks. But line speed, um, I'm not saying the attitude was wrong, but the tempo was wrong, the pace was wrong in the game. And Ulster, had, Ulster were fantastic. And, and we should, we should criticise Munster, but we should compliment the, the manner in which Ulster played and some of their players who, who played incredibly well. So... Look, I watched it and I was very, very disappointed. I felt it was almost um, kind of happening in front of my eyes when you're looking at it. And I listened to Van Gran afterwards. Um, and I agree with a lot of what he says, but um, uh, I think there's enough of blame to go around all over the place. You don't want to go, Rory, where to start, but there were several elements, elements of that monster display that were very much lacking. We'll get on to the positives from an Ulster perspective in a moment because that most certainly mm. needs highlighting. But from a monster perspective, yes, there's been a massive sea change in their coaching department with uh, Felix Jones and Jerry Flannery departing over the course of the last year and Stephen Larkham and Graham Rentry still very much betting in mm. after the World Cup. But you don't necessarily, from uh, if you're a monster fan, you won't be entirely thrilled by the fact that the performances tend to vaccinate really, really wildly. You can have very good outings, then you can have outings like we had on Friday, which are becoming all the more common when you factor in it's only, what, two wins in seven games and were bullied, not necessarily from the off, they did start well, yeah. but they fell away pretty badly. That was probably one of the most disappointing things from a Munster perspective was that they started very well and they got their try and Ulster didn't start that well and, and they kind of got to John Cooney a little bit around the rook and, and kind of ruffled his feathers a little bit and we saw him make maybe a few more errors than we've seen in, in recent weeks, although he hasn't been perfect, he's just been kind of riding out the errors and coming up with these big moments. But they lost their way and... and I, I agree with Keith, they don't have the depth and what that one of the things that really puts an emphasis on is that their internationals have to perform all the time when, they, when they're there. And I didn't think in particular that Conor, sorry, not, not Conor Murray, I thought Conor Murray was actually okay, that Keith Earls and Peter O'Mahony, two of the kind of talismanic figures in this team, were at the level that you would hope uh, from a Munster perspective they would be to bring up the standard around them. 
I think when you're looking to your leaders and your leaders are struggling themselves, then you're, you're really in a bad, you know, in a dark enough place. Like there are mitigating factors, and, and Van Gran, while he took the, the, you know, the, the responsibility on his own shoulders, did outline the fact that they haven't had the same team two weeks in a row since the World Cup at least, and maybe even before that, that he hasn't been able to build continuity. He has players for Europe, then they're whisked away by the RFU player management system, then they're back in for Europe, then they're gone for two weeks over Christmas. But I do think when you take Stander, Klein and uh, Chris Farrell out of the team, they lose an awful lot of ball-carrying ability and they basically lose the ability to win collisions. And it exposes maybe that Peter Mann, he doesn't win the collisions he used to win, that he's more of a line-out operator now, that he's kind of a breakdown threat, but when he, with the ball in hand, he's not really doing it. And then they had that kind of tight five that struggled really, really badly. Witcherly got injured. He was probably the best of the, of the lot in those opening stages. Then he, he was taken out of it. They ended up with two back rows in the second row. And they just started soaking and soaking and soaking. And Ulster are, are a bit of a momentum team. And once they started building momentum, they were just they were enjoying themselves. And then after half time, you know, Van Grant said they spoke about discipline in, in the, at half time. And they come out after half time and Keith Earls gives away a kind of a mindless penalty after Dan Goggin playing out of position gives the ball away in contact. And then they're on the back foot and they're chasing it and it's gone, really. And it's not a place, it's a little bit like Holman Park, Ravenhill is not a place you want to be when you're, ch you know, t to chase a game when the home team are up. And there was a big crowd. It was like, it was like the last vestiges of the kind of Christmas spirit. The kind of big crowd was in and all of that. So it got away from them. They do have a lot of quality to welcome back in this week against Racing. That is probably the solace for Van Grand that his first 15, despite the fact that they've lost Tyburn probably for the season, is still very strong. But you're right, they, they, need, they need to vacillate the other way now and, and the run they're on, their confidence must be taking a hit and, and they have a couple of fr fresh injury worries. Yeah, the issue of the, the pack in particular is something that struck Alan Quinlan when he spoke in this morning's OTB AM. You know, it doesn't matter who you have in the back line, in my opinion, if your forwards are getting beaten. It's Why are the forwards getting beaten? Because they're not, they're not, some of them are not good enough um, and that's the harsh reality of it. Um, some of them are underperforming um, some of them are out of form, um, and it just takes one or two, Jerry, in a t any team or three to make a couple of mistakes, just be a little bit off, and that kind of snowballs, and it makes it more difficult. And then you're playing away from home, you're playing a, a crowd, baying for blood, a team full of confidence. So little things, because they started the game well, Monster. To be fair to them, and I just thought, you know. They just didn't impose themselves. They didn't have any ball carriers. They didn't make hard yards. They didn't win the collisions. And, you know, I think I heard people, some people talking about desire. And it, it, there is a desire part to it as well. But there's just a bit of pride in it as well. That, you know, look, a few things went wrong in them and a but couple of mistakes. desire and pride are going to be all, all well and good. If you've no ball carriers, if you don't have the right players... Well, they can, just didn't, can... they didn't carry the ball the other night. You know, there's some of them well able to carry the ball. And, and, and they were a little bit naive in the way they tried to, to play the game. Ulster just fanned out um, and just smashed them and, and were up for the fight a little bit more, which is very disappointing. And I've always said this, my biggest criticism of Munster, any Munster team over the years, is if you're not up for the fight when you put on that jersey, it's a problem. It's a problem for me, and it's a problem for anyone who's ever worn the jersey. And like I said, I was never, I'm not sitting here saying I was perfect in any of my performances. I often needed a kick up the backside myself. But, you know, there is a responsibility. Keith, it's something that Rory touched on a moment ago. It's something that Alan in that clip touches on there. In terms of some players not being good enough, one, one thing to rectify that is, is strength and depth and developing that. And I know it comes in a different area of the pitch than, than Alan just mentioned there. But... I was working on the news desk over the Christmas and I saw you know the Munster team come in for one of the games and said like Craig Casey makes his first start of the season I was like surely at this point of the season he shouldn't be making his first start if he's a player that's as highly thought of these players should be worked in a little bit better and a little bit earlier in the season than we've already seen I can't argue with that at all um, I, I thought he played really well when he got when he got his game I, as far as I know he, he got a couple of bangs in that game Um um, but I would have, I'd want to have him and see an awful lot more of him. I'd like to have seen him during the World Cup, um, during those matches. That's the, that's the right opportunity under which to do it. Look, I do think there's a, a couple of issues within it. So um, if we look at some of Munster's policy for the last while and getting, we'll say, Snyman and DLN Day are due to come in next year, they're really big signings. They're really good guys. But for every two guys like that you have, you need to be bringing in some of the younger guys as well. You need to be forcing, um, uh, getting players through the academy and getting them and using them and trusting them. And 
the difficulty for Munster in that is that maybe they're not getting as much quality, they're definitely not getting as much quantity through the system as someone like Leinster. I mean, you can only look with envy at the amount of players that are coming into the Leinster Academy through the school system. So, I mean, Munster have taken steps to try and do things about that. They've, uh, they've employed um, a New Zealand coach um, this year specifically to work with clubs and schools players, Mike Petman, um, a very well-regarded young coach. Um, but we need 10 Mike Petmans to try and uh, make certain we can get all the players coming through the system. The acceleration in professional rugby um, has... Uh, you know, has put, I think, some of the old traditional routes under pressure. And I don't know that Munster are doing enough. It. So the signing of two South African players is phenomenal because they're very big name players and they're very good players. And they every team needs two or three or four of those, to be honest. Um, uh, but Munster need to be making certain that they can get younger guys through the system. So they have to, they have to up that game as quickly as they possibly can. And for that, you, you're always going to need more money. You're always going to need more resources um, and you're also going to need the, the, the will to try and make that happen. And I think it's this year and this time of the year is very frustrating for Munster. And I think they saw it coming. Um, and I know we discussed it at one stage that this would be a hard year for Munster because 12 guys on a World Cup um, squad, when you don't have the strength and depth, puts you under huge pressure when the IRFU comes in and says, well, that's great, but all those players have to have two weeks off. So that's tough for them and puts them under huge pressure to do it. Um, but I do think we need to be trying to bring more of the younger guys through the system. They are there. The two guys who were the standout guys for Munster last week were um, uh, Shane Daly and Jack O'Sullivan. I thought they'd find it like Jack O'Sullivan came on, but Shane Daly was phenomenal. And, you know, you need those players to be coming in, but you'd want them to come into a side. There's two guys coming in to 13 guys that are settled in as much as is possible. Leinster have a different system and it's it's probably not right to compare one with the other. Um, and I say, I'm saying it with envy because I think what they're actually doing is absolutely excellent. And you see some of the players that are coming in. They're young guys at 20 and 21. They seem to be ready to play at the top level very, very quickly. And they're pushing other players all the time. So um, there is a, a bounty of riches on one side. Um, Munster needs to get more out of their structures and need to maybe try and pick them as well. You touched on something there. Do you think there needs to be more done between the province itself and liaising with the, the schools and the clubs in trying to develop players more and trying to offer them a clearer pathway, I guess? Uh, there, I think there needs to be more support given to the schools. You know, the schools rugby is the schools rugby. They do their own thing. And um, they're, the vast majority are not private schools or, or they're semi-private in some cases in Munster. Um, so they're, they need coaching resources. They need help and support to upskill. So that's what you're looking for, a higher level of skill um, that goes through it. There's an awful lot of good players coming through the system. I'm watching, I'm watching an awful lot of schools rugby at the present uh, moment in time because I've my kids are playing um they're all in secondary school so you're you're seeing a lot some of the talent is there we need to maximize it and fast track it um there's uh you know we need to get our players through the academy in, into the academy and through the academy but an awful lot of the Leinster players barely seem to be touching the academy on their side they almost seem fully formed by the, the time they come out at 19 19 and a half um Keith's touched on it there Rory about the IRFU obviously dictating how many minutes and how many mm. games uh, an international player in particular will play. Player welfare obviously is a, is a very key issue. It's interesting to note that they seem to have such you know fine detail on how players are performing and how players are used at the top end. Should that not also follow through with how players are developed and should there not be a set number of standards in place that you know, each province has to follow this, or are they so also well, wildly mean, different that you can't necessarily impose I, the same I, rules? About I, yeah, well, I think there is that. I think you can't. You're really not judging like with like with say Leinster and Connacht, for example, or you know to a lesser extent, Leinster and Munster. They all have different models and different systems. And I, I like the RFU do manage all of these academies. The, the the coaches were told that you know they wear Leinster and Munster gear, but they're actually employed directly from the RFU. So those. Like there is, it is, a, you know, a, a, a flat structure as far as I know. You know, like a kind of it, it is supposed to all come up into the national playing pool, so it's all targeted in the same way. But I mean, there's a need, like, for all that the RFU and we want 
Irish rugby to succeed, there's also a need for Munster. And Johan van Grand's job is to win games for Munster. So if he, you know, it, it is his prerogative to to go with Albie Matthewson over Craig Casey if he doesn't think Craig, Craig Casey's ready or, or Nick McCarthy. You know, and, and Matt, Matthewson's departure and Irish few enforced things one of the big blows to Munster's uh, season because they were able to bring on this all back with 20 minutes to go and change the pace, especially with Murray maybe not being at his best. So, uh, like I think I I don't think the RFU can micromanage everything. I think. I mean, there's an argument that they're already micromanaging the player management too much, and that's something that's really holding Munster back because Munster had to, you know, had to go two weeks with their internationals away. You know, it's a thir- thirteen-month season, so you, they do need to rest sometimes. So it's it's an imperfect thing. So no, I don't think they can go and micromanage to that level. And I think if you look at the numbers, they're actually bringing through plenty of players, and there's loads, plenty of homegrown players there. It's whether the, the, the players are good enough, and mm. you know, you can drop, a, say, a Jeremy Lockman or um, a Keenan Knox into a kind of a starting. Uh, pack and they'll look quite good but if you put them all in that pack together with an inexperienced second row behind them that tight five got rolled over and, and as a result the ball was slow for the team and for all that you know what's keep uh, has uh, you know raised some serious and, and very valid points the here and now is is is, is all about winning against Racing at the weekend and and like and getting their confidence right and getting their playing style right because that's you know Van Grand is is overseeing it all but like you know if he if they go out in the pool stage having uh, drawn at home to Racing and lost away to Racing and then kind of mismanaged those Saracens games, then you know that's going to come on him, you know. Yeah, we mentioned Ulster being a momentum side, Keith. <clears throat> when you only have two wins in seven games, uh, like you're heading away to Paris this weekend, Munster, and you're wondering where that performance that they need is going to come from. Is it something that they're capable of pulling out of the bag? Are we going to have to rely on those wells of hunger and, and, and pride and all that kind of thing more so? Yeah, yeah, it's two wins and a draw. And it, you know, I... <laughs> Look, I think it's a, a tough. I, we tried to touch on this a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, with the shallowness of the squad almost at the moment. Whether, um, you know, whether they'd be able to win it, and whether it would be the worst thing in the world if they didn't. It's the worst thing for every fan because everybody wants to see Munster get to a quarter final and to drive on their history and to drive everything on again. Um, and you have to be almost careful what you wish for. Um, but I would, um, I would know that when I, when, you know, when I look at a, a, a Munster 15 that has got um, all their guys back and ready playing in a big game, I know they'll give a performance. The difficulty for them is to give a performance in which is a truly crazy sort of uh, uh, environment over in Paris, and it really is. Um, and it's going to be played very fast. It's a very, very fast ground, and it isn't as if Racing are just fast. They're big and fast and powerful. Um, having said that, can Munster go and do it? Uh, they absolutely can, because they have that capacity, and they've shown that capacity time and time again. And yes, maybe it's better teams have shown that in the past to this particular team. But you try and say that to any of those individuals who are coming in for criticism this week or last week because their performances weren't great enough. You say it to the coaches who have uh, won on a world stage, who have delivered on a world stage, that this is something that, uh, that is acceptable for them. There's no way in the world that they'd let that be acceptable. So I would expect to see a huge performance in here. I don't think the run-in is a good run-in. I, I, whatever about the IRFU's policy of minding players, and I believe we should be minding players, we absolutely should, this is not a way to do it, to take 12 players out of a team over two weeks um, before uh, a must-win game. That seems to be putting the IRFU's um, uh, position first over and above the provinces. So they get away with it in Leinster because Leinster have a huge number of players. I don't know that they get away with it in Munster. Mm. One of the things that we saw obviously at the, at the weekend was I'm not going to even say this was a subtext of the match because it, it clear, so clearly dominated the conversation going into it was that head to head of John Cooney and Conor Murray. You touched that there. Conor Murray didn't have a bad game oh, on, on Friday by any means, and I don't think he's played badly, badly over the course of the last while. He's just been outshone, I guess, by the, the form of John Cooney, and we saw that case in point what he can offer. Pretty much all on all ends of the pitch. On, on there's, just a, there's a lot to be said for someone who scores a try in nearly every game he plays, you know. And and just you know, Murray, Murray has never had a, a stinker of a game for Ireland or Munster in, in the last year. He's had a couple of, you know, he's been below the level that we expected from him. But that was like an eight or nine out of ten, pretty much consistently all the time. And that's what you, like you're watching Cooney play out of a skin on a week to week basis. And and Andy Farrell's decision is whether he goes for. Conor Murray at six or seven, or, or maybe five sometimes against Cooney at you know eight or nine, and it, that's that's the decision that's on his that that is um, on his, his in tray at the moment. 
but Cooney definitely pressed his case really, really well. He overcame those early errors and he's just so sharp and so smart in what he does all the time. He just looks like he's a lot of energy. He's an energy giver to the team. He makes good decisions. He's working really well in tandem with Billy Burns. He's got McCluskey there who's absolutely in incredible form and is playing his way into the Ireland se yeah, selection um, you know, it, issues as well. Like Some of the offloads he threw were, were very smart as well as being sensational as well as his good defence. So I... You know, Cooney's the four man. If you're picking, if you're picking an Irish fifteen on purely on form right now, who's been the best fifteen of this season? It's John Cooney. Obviously, Andy Farrell's prerogative is to pick the team that's going to play Scotland. You know, it's will this team beat Scotland? Who's who's at number eight? Who's at number ten? They're the decisions he's making around it. But it's hard to argue against Cooney right now. I mean, I, you know, I would pick him based on what he's doing, and and I'd probably put Cooney on the or sorry Murray on the bench and and keep him very much involved because he's too important to start leaving it leaving out altogether. Is that you've mentioned the the cheekiness? I guess is how you put it about uh, John Cooney before, and the, there's a, almost a, 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 an arrogance in the way he plays in a very very good sense is what you mentioned about him before, Keith. I'm wondering how that might work alongside of Jonathan Sexton. Can you see them working in tandem in a green jersey together? Uh, they'd get over it pretty quickly how to work together if they go both got picked for Ireland together. Um, you just can't. You have to have a healthy ego, but it has to be an ego that somehow fits within the team. So that that would happen. That would, I wouldn't have any issue with that whatsoever. Mm. Um, it's it's funny. I would just on Rory's point, and he's talking about whether Connor is playing well or playing badly. Um, I'd like to see him play with a little bit more freedom. I'd like to see him go and play um, uh, to get with a smile on his face. I said the same about Johnny Sexton. And it's funny when, when the media, and of course we're all in the media, but when the media starts talking about, oh, it's definitely Cooney over Murray, and it would be a disgrace if it isn't. And there is articles in the papers that Farrell has to do it. Well, Farrell doesn't have to do anything that the media tell him to do. He has to make his own decision as to what he wants. But the guy who is lucky the guy who is full of confidence and playing bloody well is John Cooney. Um, uh, the guy who has a little bit of the world on his shoulders is Conor Murray, you know. And it's funny, I thought there was a stark difference to Johnny Sexton when he came back from the World Cup. And I thought he didn't look particularly happy out there when he came back. Um, I, mean, I haven't spoken to him about this at all. But when he came back, you visibly could see him chatting to people, not berating them talking to them there seemed to be a slightly lifting of it's a pressure thing and uh, um, just because of styles or be, because of structures or because of different freedoms that you might have um, I think Connor is class I think he is one of the best players I've seen in an Irish jersey um, I don't think he's playing as fluidly as he could have played and I, like it looked as if he doubted himself a couple of times in the second half the other day he was going to pass and then didn't pass and then people are saying it's a slow pass it isn't maybe not helped by, by some of the other players playing outside him and some of the doubt. All you want is certainty when you're playing. Um, and uh, I would say Cooney had certainty on Friday. His pack were steamrolling uh, Munster for large um, uh, large elements of the game. He's running onto the ball. Life is an awful lot easier if that's the case. And I'm not taken away from him because he is scoring tries and when you're in that zone, you kind of want to continue in that zone for as long as you can. I hope he goes well in that zone this weekend because yeah. like, you just want that to go. You never want that zone to stop. You want to ride that crest to, to the height of what it can get to it. Just to add to that, I mean, Murray's come into a new setup from a World Cup disappointment as well. So Cooney's come, <laughs> you know, has been there the whole way through. He's been playing with these players. Ulster only had two currently playing players at the World Cup because Rory Best retired. They've had that continuity. Sexton's dropped back into a, a, a setup that's been going since 2016. That he's been a leader in. That you know he, he knows Lancaster very well. Whereas Cooney's coming into Stephen Arkham's new Munster and trying to learn a week before he's playing Huntington Cup rugby two games. Then he go. Then he sent off on holidays because he needs a break. Comes back in for two games. Sent off on holidays for two weeks. He's back in for a game. So he is trying to learn a system mm -hmm. and a setup. And I think they're caught a little still. I think they were fine when, when they had a full pre-season and they had no internationals. Started, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So they, they, they had no internationals for the pre-season. They look good in the early part of the season. They bring their internationals back. They're kind of caught between Razzie Ball and, and Stephen Larkin Ball at the moment. And I think it might be next season before, or even maybe post Six Nations, when they get a run of Pro 14 games and maybe Europe, if they can pull it off this week, that they can actually get their game plan going. And I think that is an important thing to remember when we're talking about Munster because there's been a lot of change at a time when they didn't have their top men there to deliver that change. Uh, we mentioned Ulster, Keith. There's a few players actually put their hands up for selection from an Irish perspective um, over the course of the next couple of months. 
two that stood out to me, Stuart McCloskey obviously got man of the match. Uh, the physicality of Will Addison at full back, that's going to ask a major question of Andy Farrell and, and who he'd fancy at 15 going into the Six Nations because I thought Addison was superb. Yeah, I, there was a couple of big hits um, from Addison that I really liked. And I know that there was uh, a bit of criticism that he maybe was not the most physical uh, in the past. I just want to see him play and play and play. I'm not really worried about Ireland with him yet. And I think he is a class act, but I'd like to see him get a body of games underneath him and continue to build that level of confidence. He offers a different, actually, it's quite interesting, both himself and Haley in Munster have an incredibly elusive running style. You know, they both come from the same the same spot, uh, came over at the same time. They just they have a way of gliding that a lot of other guys don't have, which is interesting to watch. Thought he played very well. Um, Stuart McCluskey is one that I have to say has just confused me for years. I'm I'm. Um, uh, he's a big, awkward fella in the centre, which is never any harm, um, and. He has a touch of subtlety that I know isn't liked by a lot of coaches that don't want that that offload that uh, five times out of 10, they want it one out of 20 done perfectly. He will always try to, to, to push it and push it. If you put players around him that know to expect it, that will work. If you put players around him that don't know to expect it, don't run the lines, then it goes to ground. Uh, Ulster know and fully expect him to have a cut at every available opportunity and because of that they they pay off nine times out of ten so look I thought he was excellent the other day I think he has a good sense of, of space in the centre he seems to to have a high level of confidence um, but I will at the point that Rory said there um, most of that Ulster team like I think Ulster have done incredibly well last year the year before they were in fair shambles you know uh, lots of players missing um, they didn't fully fill out all their squad and do everything I think they've done it really well really sensibly have managed to do it without being under a huge amount of pressure but they have kept a core that have played an awful lot and when that core is not going off to play for Ireland it means that they're playing consistently as a team all the time. And I, for me, that was the difference, actually, on Friday, is Ulster played as a team and uh, Munster played as um, a half a team with a load of other guys that were brought mm. in. And that's, you know, that's, that's, that's quite hard for me to say. I don't like saying that. Um, so when I go back to Quinny and Quinny says whether, you know, they're just absolutely, it's not good enough, um, uh, a lot of those players aren't playing a huge amount of rugby, but I would challenge any pack of forwards to do well with two back rows in the second row. You know, unless they're big squat guys, I'd love to see Quinny spend a bit of extra time. It might have shut him up more <laughs> in the field too, mind you, if he was in the second row. But you know, it is hard. So you're looking at it and you're saying, are all these reasons or the excuses? They're a little bit of both, I think. You know, I don't, I don't think you can hide away from that fact either. It's stuff you can work on as well. I mean, you've got two new coaches in fairly important positions mm -hmm. after coming in during the course of the summer. Who, again, we mentioned standing starts. They're still trying to find their way themselves. <clears throat> Uh, absolutely. So, look, I'm, the, the, the urge for every Munster fan, actually, I would say for not every Irish fan, but most Irish fans who, who kind of take off the jersey a little bit, the provincial jersey, you need strong provinces. You need four strong provinces. Um, as it stands at the present moment in time, uh, Leinster are providing a core element to all the other provinces. We don't want that to become the, the central part of what Irish rugby is going forward. We really don't because we want to have our identity. We want Connacht to have an identity. Ulster, the same. Munster, absolutely the same. So that needs to happen. Um, so we, we need to be realistic then as well. This year is, is a hard year for Irish provinces. Um, Leinster aside, Ulster, I think Ulster are doing very well because they They've only had two guys on that Ireland squad because Rory Best has retired. So um, they're not strung out over it. If we go back four years ago, Connacht flew four years ago. They had nobody involved with Ireland. They did incredibly well while all the other provinces were struggling. Um, now they had a few guys in it this year. Even a few guys puts them under pressure. You pick up a couple of injuries, life becomes an awful lot uh, harder. Um, I just think it's the nature of this particular year. And I think it makes it very, very tough for everybody. But rather than get angry or kind of hurl blame at everybody, I, I think you have to look at these situations and say, OK, I don't know that the IRFU has necessarily got it right this time. I really don't. Um, I think they've put pressure on, on provinces. 
that uh, is unnecessary. And I think if you actually take a financial view to it, uh, will CVC like this in the coming years that you'd have a big game like Munster against Leinster and say, actually, you're putting your second teams out for that? I don't know if they'll want that. The commercial body is looking for commercial returns. They're really big marquee games, you know. So uh, I think I think Ireland do and the IRFU do an unbelievably good job. The vast majority of what they do has kept Ireland pretty much at the top level. And I know we didn't perform in the World Cup, but it's, it's kept us at the top of the game for the last 15 or so years, which is pretty fantastic stuff. Um, but not everything is perfect, and we do need to protect that a little. Gee, so around this time of year, I mean, in these kind of years, in the quote-unquote cycle, do you put more uh, responsibility and more, uh, you know, trust in the hands of the provincial coaches rather than the IRFU simply saying, right, these lads are involved in internationals, they need this week off. You just let the uh, the provinces have at it. Uh, I, 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 actually, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is for it. I think it's worth a proper conversation to have with it. Um, uh, like, if you look anywhere else, if you look in any of the other teams, any of the other countries, the uh, all the rugby teams are suffering financially because they're trying to find their way. It's still a very new sport professionally and and like 20 odd years is still a tiny 25 years whatever it is now it's just a tiny amount of time for that so there's still things being found out and figured out all the time um what changes are going to happen in rugby in the next period of time we do need to protect our, our players we also need to get our younger talent through more so in the last number of years three or four or five years in particular Leinster are doing a phenomenal job with that uh, the other provinces are not doing as well as they'd like to be doing. They're definitely not doing as well as Leinster. Yeah, we should mention our rugby coverage is thanks to Vodafone team of us, everyone in. Um, on that subject, Connacht are one of these sides who, from a player pathway and from a development standpoint, are going to need all the help they can get. And I guess financial finances are going to be one of those areas. When you see the sides that they had to put out at the weekend on Saturday against uh, Leinster at the RDS and taking the pace in that they did, it was a very difficult watch from a Connacht perspective. I know there are a lot of caveats to it, but again, it's it was it was a rough game. I mentioned to, to somebody that they were looking to go to the game on, on Saturday, and that watching Leinster is a bit you know there's, there's no competition to to make the sides are playing at the moment, and Connacht unfortunately with the the roadblock on Saturday. I went to the I was off on Saturday. Watched uh, on telly. Went to the cinema and um, I. The film finished and the lights came up and the guy sitting in front of me was wearing his Leinster uh, scarf and jersey. So he obviously hadn't seen enough entertainment at the RDS and decided that he uh, he needed to take his knives out to, to complete his Great evening. movie. Very good movie. Great movie. Um, and like it was a bit like, you know, they kind of, re the reveal is more towards the start than the end. It's a bit like Leinster, they kind of oh, got, it, got everything done. No, I'm not, no spoilers if it happens early. Um, like, they kind of a year ago turned up at the RDS and, and should have beaten Leinster. Now it wasn't as, was it as strong, it was a probably less, slightly less strong Leinster team, it was probably a stronger Connacht team, Jack Hardy was riding the crest of a wave, I think Bundy was playing. Mm. They had their Ireland players, um, but they were able to, you know, to force Leinster into, you know, last minute heroics um, at, the, at the same venue. To see them come up and uh, play the way they did, Against a Leinster team who were who are operating at a different level to everyone else, they're like the super problems that are that are making everyone else look bad, really. Um, but still, to concede within two minutes um, and to you know to give up so many line breaks, it must be very concerning for any friend because they have a very ready-made excuse and a very valid excuse in the injuries. But your know, friend is someone who talks about a no, a no excuse culture, um, but the players he's putting out there are just not you know the, this fairly fairly sure there's no one in that Connacht team that will get into that. Leinster side, you know, at, at right now, and that Leinster side was was missing a lot of internationals. You know, Leinster's first try is set up by their uh, third choice uh, loose head. Their second try is set up by their fourth choice number eight. Their third try is set up by their third choice uh, out half. The fourth try is scored by a centre who is an Australian international but can't get into their Champions Cup team, and that's I think it's four tries in about fifteen minutes, and uh, forty points by half time. And nineteen they were, minutes is when the so yeah, it yeah. was just absolutely rampant stuff. It was so impressive to watch. And Connacht just couldn't live with them, and it's a bit of it's sorry, it's a major concern that even with the injuries, Connacht cannot live with Leinster in any way. Considering four years ago they beat them in a Pro 14 final, um, you know that's and they're under a very good coach. They've got some very good players. They do have a very extensive injury list, and, and as I say, that is a valid excuse. But the gulf between them was quite alarming.
that's you know that's what we really were looking at on Saturday, Keith, wasn't it? First versus fourth, and there's a hell of a huge gap between the two. Yeah, there's a huge gap. And just to, on one of Rory's points there, you'd say Andy Friend would be, would be really worried about some of the gaps that are happening in defence. It's nigh on impossible to bring a guy in who isn't playing at that level all the time to understand the nuance of defence. And even, like you could say, the very simple thing, just push up hard and you can do that. That doesn't work unless everybody else is doing it. And defence is where you get exposed by a good team. And uh, some of Munster's problems on Friday were the same for players that haven't played a huge amount of that level, suddenly playing at a team that is very comfortable playing at that level, playing very well. They'll pick open those holes. That's what actually happened for, for Connacht, was they just, the, the, their players got exposed. And it, sometimes it isn't the player that you see um, missing the tackle's fault. It could be the doubt of other players on either side of them. So you don't know, is he going to get there? Is he not going to get there? So suddenly they rush into a certain space to fill a space and they leave a large gap because they don't, isn't that they don't trust each other. They don't know each other enough to trust each other. That's, that's, rugby's a tough game. Rugby is not, um, people, you know, when they say that it's simple, it isn't simple and it's become infinitely more complex. You have to play to particular systems. A lot of those things are done by rote. Um, so I'm not quite sure how Leinster are managing to do that so well, but apparently they're training at a level where it's pretty much interchangeable because everybody's at that, either they're already at that level before they're starting or whatever it is that's happening. So, and they're doing really well. I mean, I look, I've mentioned the word twice. I'll do it again. Envy. It's a joy to watch a team be able to go and play and, and be interchangeable like that. Um, I'd rather it was in red because I'm a monster fan, but, um, but uh, I'm, I'm happy that it's happening within Irish players. And I'm happy that we're going to see some of those guys play for the first time in the Six Nations. I think that's pretty important too. Mm. Keith Wood, thanks very much. Cheers, lads. Rory, thank you as well. Thank you. If Cheers. we take away anything from today, it's to go and see Knives Out because this is <laughs> quite genuinely a fantastic film. Don't forget as well uh, that Connors versus Toulouse on the sports ground is live and off the ball on Saturday. Monday Night Rugby on Off the Ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us. Everyone in.